The cool thing about Green Lantern is that it's an intergalactic police force. And you're following guys that have become a part of it. You meet all these alien worlds and different alien adventures, and it expands to it. great epic battles that no other character in comic books really can match. I think Green Lantern has the potential to be one of the most popular and loved characters in any medium. It's just waiting for people to, to discover it, and I think they've discovered it through comics. When I was a kid, there was a select few comic books I actually had the money for. Flash has always been my favourite superhero. Batman was a must, of course, a bit of Spider-Man here and there, but it was Green Lantern, specifically Jeff John's Green Lantern, that had me enthralled. That had my money. Green Lantern is a great hero, but you don't need to hear me repeat myself. If you want to hear all about that, you can watch the first part of this two-part video. The link will be down below. In the first video, we broke down what went wrong in 2011's Green Lantern. More importantly, we highlighted the more subtle aspects from the comics that were missing in the film. Larger narrative problems or issues with characterization. We highlighted what made Hal Jordan of the comics so compelling. Regardless, today we're here outlining how to make a good Green Lantern movie. A six movie saga that I'll promptly get to. One with a visceral sense of action and purpose, awe and scale. A story that has a clearly defined journey. So let's once again take a look at Green Lantern. Look, I feel like I have to say this, by no means am I a screenwriter, I'm just a guy with a few ideas. Ideas I think would make a semi-decent scaffold, if you will, for an actual movie. A series of movies. And possibly a show. A framework that Warner Brothers could follow to give us a Green Lantern movie that emphasises the purpose of the character and the scale beholden to such a character. To give Warner Brothers their Star Wars, if you will. Look. Making a saga is a big ambition. It isn't something you just make up on the go. Look what happened to the Star Wars sequels. Not just looking at what the next three movies might be. Shut your fucking mouth! Making a saga requires foresight, ambition, and above all, vision. Like what Lucas did with his Star Wars movies and Cameron is currently doing with his Avatar movies, for a Green Lantern saga to work, it'll have to cast and write the characters accordingly that they pop in and out of stories when need be. Whilst Atrocitus can appear in the first movie, it won't be until the third movie that he becomes a threat. Whilst Abin Sur can die in the first movie, his character can live on through flashbacks with Sinestro, or tales from the Guardians of his findings, a prophecy for Blackest Night. Whilst Carol can be, well, Carol, she can be the Star Sapphire and join the War of Light later down the track. My point is if we're going to do a saga, we have to build it the right way, as an intergalactic soap opera, whilst taking individual care for each movie themselves. So whilst they collectively are great, they still manage to stand on their own. People often say that Green Lantern is the Star Wars of DC, an obvious comparison when you think about it. Intergalactic politics, a magical police force, space battles, it's an accurate observation, but I want to take that further. I believe Star Wars is a story about destiny and fate, but not in the hopeful way that we know it to be. One older, more mythic. Our meeting was destiny. No, Abin, it was luck. That that word, destiny, might not be a good thing. Something not inherently pleasant. A character facing evil and making the choice to go down that path or not. A character choosing to become his father or not. In that way, Star Wars isn't a story about playing good versus evil, it's about characters choosing between good and evil. This is important for a Green Lantern saga. This won't be the story of rage against hope, fear against will, it'll be the story of characters choosing rage, choosing hope, choosing greed, and choosing love, and so on. This makes the characters far more interesting and fascinating than this is a Sith, and this is the rage core, or the fear core. It makes the characters multifaceted, they're people with choices. When you create a saga, you have to establish two things, a solid structure and poignant themes. These themes must permeate and build upon itself in future movies. Since the central theme in Green Lantern, the core idea if you will, is the value of emotion, the first movie and subsequent movies must build upon this. That's why I think the Manhunters should be the villains for the first movie. It's kind of a no-brainer actually. Opposite to life, they are lifeless. Opposite to emotions in that they have none. They're cold. It creates an obvious parallel and a clear threat, like a bunch of intergalactic Terminators. Making the Manhunters the villains for the first movie also allows us to build villains like Sinestro and Atrocitus for future movies, but we'll get to that soon. 
Now, as I said before, a solid structure is also important too, and when it comes to a good sequel, often flipping structure helps surprise the audience whilst keeping things vaguely familiar. With structure, you have to create narrative inversions and spin what worked for one movie on its head so it might not work in another movie. A great example of this is A New Hope. Everything Luke used to become a hero in the first movie, his bravery, loyalty, and trust in his ability was used against him in Empire, those same attributes becoming his undoing. In a way, creating narrative inversions that surprise and twist the characters in new and unexpected directions. And whilst Luke may have jumped into a trap to help his friends, all of this is still well within his character. I can't keep the vision out of my head, they're my friends, I gotta help them. You must not go. But Han and Leia will die if I don't. The same say could be done for Hal, using his fear, leap first mentality, his heroic nature, bravado, ego, and self-hate against him. Sinestro using Hal's strengths and weaponizing them into weaknesses in the second installment. Naturally, a trilogy needs to tie up in some way. Lucas did this through creating an inversion of an inversion. If Empire Strikes Back turned things upside down, then Return of the Jedi turned things inside out. Whilst A New Hope's central conflict was the space battle, here the space battle is in the background to the real drama here. Applying this to Green Lantern would work all too well. In movie one, Atrocitus was featured, but only to warn Abin Sur about Blackest Night. I have seen the future of the Green Lantern Corps. I have seen its destiny. Should you care to hear it? Continue. Whilst the central conflict was surrounding the Manhunters. However, in movie 3, this is flipped on its head. Atrocitus is now the main threat, but only because of the Manhunters. His backstory fueled by their atrocities. Huh. Atrocitus. Atrocities. Huh. Nice. Now, this rhythm of inversion should fill the entire saga. Like Lucas said, Again, it's like poetry, so if they rhyme. A rhythm of inversions that makes the story feel new and different each installment, but unified under something recognizable from the last. A movie like Attack of the Clones is filled with inversions. Heroes are now on the assault, characters are put into familiar circumstances. Like I originally said, the central theme of this saga and the point of the Green Lantern story is about the value of emotion, that by the end of the movie, we should develop that idea more. In the first movie, it's about establishing that emotion is inherently important and is the right tool to use over the emotionless manhunters. In movie two, it's about overcoming your fears, to not be without fear, but to control it, to be beyond it. This conflict aided by Sinestro's twisted worldview. In the third movie, the value of emotion is again laid upon, that all emotion is important as we see the new core of hope cleanse Hal of his corruption by rage. That way we're developing that theme of emotion, that it's inherently important, all of it. Moving into movies four to six, that structure of inversion again has to be flipped. Whilst movie one was about a lifeless force of monsters, movie six also has to be about this, but with the blackest night an inversion across six movies. Movie two being about how the lies and hubris of the Guardians creates a threat, that being Sinestro, so movie five must also be an inversion of that, the first lantern, Krona, and so forth, the one who first disobeyed the Guardians and harnessed Will into a gauntlet. This leaves us with movie four, what should be the beginning of a new trilogy, but also a continuation of movie three, any inversion here might be structure-wise instead of characters. Whilst movie 3 might end with a big battle, maybe movie 4 starts off with one and only gets more and more personal as the story goes on, developing Hal's understanding of other cores in a new, enlightening way. What we have here is a bunch of narrative inversions, structurally too, so the movies have a parallel. This makes the movies feel unique and different each time, but unified thematically, that it might be the lies and the hubris of the Guardians that is their undoing each time, that the theme of emotion and its value is called into question. So that's the general structure of how we're going to do these movies. Something I've left out is a HBO Max show that I'd run concurrent with the series of films. Whilst the movies would be titled Green Lantern, the show would be the Green Lantern core, introducing and developing other human lanterns before they make an appearance in the movie. That way they enter the films alongside Hal as three-dimensional characters and we can get straight into telling a story. It also allows us to keep that attention on Hal in the movies. And that way it also allows us to explore alien worlds to new depths, the ecosystems, weather, flora and political climate of these planets one that is in touch with nature, one that is under an authoritarian rule, one that was decimated by the Manhunters. Heck, even Owen can get some expansion as we see in Owen Medbay, or what that may look like. What this could do is give us depth to the locations and characters we see in the movies, to continue their journeys parallel to the movies, that the movies are Hal's journey through his eyes 
his saga, much like they are to Anakin or Luke, but the show can expand upon things outside of the main character and update us with the state of the universe, the whereabouts of other lanterns. Next, we'll have to cast the thing, and then I'll go over the story from movies 1 to 6 and how we'll work in and out of all these characters. First off, I'm just going to cast the obvious fan favourites, actors who are literally these characters, that way I can focus on the ones I actually have to explain. So for Saint Walker, it's Doug Jones, the man is literally made for prosthetics and has worked with Del Toro in pretty much every movie monster you could imagine, so yeah, he'd fit that slim build nicely. For Worth, it's Irfan Khan, a no-brainer, he's just got the perfect voice for the character. I think David Dasmalchen would kill Black Hand and Bill Nye as the voice of Necron. Volthoom is Michael Fassbender and Atrocitus is Kevin Grievix. Whilst he has the size to do the mocap work, it's the voice that really convinced me here. You know, it's kind of funny. Um... You know, I guess science fiction was my first love. That voice is deeper than my love for Superman, I shit you not. Now, Zoe Kravitz was my initial choice for Uruk, but she's Catwoman, so... I, I don't know how to pronounce her name, I'm so sorry. Go... No, I'm not even gonna try it, whatever. She's gonna be my Uruk. That's my choice. For Laughleys, it's David Tennant, no explanation really needed there. For the rest of the Green Lanterns that aren't really main players, here's them, take a look. And for the main Guardians, with serious amounts of dialogue, I'd cast Hugo Weaving as Appa Aliapsa, Glenn Close as Saeed, and Michael Gammon as Ganthet, with Mark Hamill voicing Krona and Kathy Bates as Scar. Looking at the characters that deserve some explanation, I think it's appropriate that we first start with Hal. Look, honestly, I don't have an actor for Hal yet. The closest I've come to finding with someone the right look, age, build, and sense of character is Jensen Ackles. I know it's a popular fan cast choice, but just listen. He has that no time for red tape quality. Holy. Where's my brother? Hold up, how did you- The back-chatting, charming quality. Are you talking to me? I'm afraid another guy who's seen taxi driver one too many times. Yeah, I'm talking to you. Someone willing to fight dirty, someone that doesn't take well to authority, but is a man of duty and purpose as well. He's shown to be someone that doesn't give up, no matter the odds that are stacked against him. Someone willing to overcome a threat much more powerful on paper than himself. That his will is stronger than theirs. And if you've been keeping track, these are all the qualities we discussed how it has in the last video. Attributes we need to see in this saga. Look, whilst Jensen is a nice choice and looks like hell a fair bit, especially with the longer hair as of recent, he's still a placeholder choice for me. If there's some undiscovered younger actor with these attributes and more, then I'm willing to cave to that, but right now every other possible candidate is just too old for hell. As for John, I want to go with someone reminiscent of what we got from Justice League Unlimited. Tyrese Gibson? Just... No, Michael J. White, I'd get the vibe that he just would overact the role, not really being able to play the subtleties of the character. John David Washington and Travante Rhodes just seems a bit young for the John that I've envisioned. Idris Elba seems a bit too old and grizzled for what I want, so I've landed on Sterling K. Brown. To me, he just fits the build and look of John Stewart. He's got a commanding voice that has levels of depth and emotion backing it. He's a fantastic actor, and I think he'd make a great John. With Guy, there's only one guy I thought of. If you're unfamiliar with Guy, just check out his appearances in Young Justice. That's pretty close to how he is, or how they could adapt him, and have his cocky bravado be palatable. <laughs> yeah, the ring won't translate that last word, but I can tell you what it means. I got the gist. Thank you. Still, we could always use more raw power. And Earth has a third Green Lantern, Guy Gardner. No. no. But we could really- No. For Guy, I'm choosing Sean William Scott. He just exudes Guy. He's a force to be reckoned with when things get serious, but completely lovable and a joy to watch on screen. For Kyle Rayner, I want to cast someone with a sense of youth. The youngest of the four human lanterns, I went with Henry Zaga. Is that how you pronounce his name? Zaga? Sega? Whatever. He was in the New Mutants movie as Sunspot, and well, based off that, I think he could handle the power of the white light. If you know anything about Kyle, you know that he has a lot of inventive constructs, and for a time he was the sole Green Lantern, making him extremely powerful. I just think he'd slot into this spot of Kyle really nicely here. As for Sinestro, there's only one man I want, who can pull off the presence and that moustache as good as Mark Strong. That man is Luke Evans. Seriously, this guy was made for Sinestro. The pace at which he speaks, his smooth mannerisms, there's something calm and collected about him. I could totally buy him biting his tongue to the Guardians, believing their bullshit until he puts his plan to overthrow them in motion. In terms of casting, this is the cast I'd want. Now, that leaves us with an obvious question. What would I want to see in a Green Lantern film? Well, I think an obvious first thing is the suits. No CGI suits. Look, it made sense. It was a nice idea, but it blows the budget way out of hand for no reason. Makes our characters look weightless, like a bunch of floating heads, and well, 
It just doesn't look great. Now, I'm not saying go pure practical either. Something definitely went wrong if Hal Jordan is in a cloth suit. I just think a nice harmony between practical and CG is what we're after here. Have the characters in real sets, give us practical monsters in bars or clubs, have the world feel lived in with real places, but use CGI in creative ways to assist the suits, to make them feel super. Have the suits glow when a lantern is using his powers intensely. Maybe their eyes go bright white and the lantern emblem glows from their chest. I think that harmony between CGI and practical would make the universe feel more tangible, still heightened, but real. I want to see constructs like that DC online trailer. I don't know, it just looks pleasing to me. The color of the green, how it dissipates. I'd love if Hal's eyes went white in extreme circumstances that took a lot of will. I don't know, just would be a nice touch. I want to see the power of a green lantern, have this tool be used to the best of its ability. This ring is meant to be the most powerful weapon in the galaxy. I want to see that. I want to see creative yet practical uses to solve conflicts. I want to feel a sense of force behind the use of the ring. Naturally, because we're working with space battles, the physics are hard for these kinds of fights, to display a sense of weight and impact in a weightless environment, to show that a hit matters. Humans don't know how hard a construct is, how much it would hurt. We can't fly. That's why superpowered punches in the sky tend to feel weightless. To give this movie a real sense of stakes, I would have characters have cheekbones get cut open by a significant hit by a construct. If a character flies into a mountain, perhaps it takes the wind out of them. Have big grand cinematic moments, sure, but ground a genuine sense of danger in actual hand-to-hand -hand combat too. This is something The Matrix and Raimi's Spider-Man did so well. A sense of consequence for getting hit. I'd just love a movie that shows a genuinely threatening and powerful hero and villain. Genuine danger every time Hal engages in a conflict. This adding suspense is how I might try to de-escalate a situation he knows is going to turn south. A good example of this might be a battle with a 9 foot tall Atrocitus. Someone clearly stronger than him is a lot scarier when he has a ring and he starts to close the distance and get his hands on you. I think this goes without saying that the movie must have a scale on par with Star Wars or Avatar. A saga that plays it safe can't reach operatic Shakespearean moments like this. That's cinema. This is just cinema. Just imagine that, but with Hal and Sinestro instead. We can do that, but the movie has to own the right to do that. I see through the lies of the Jedi. I do not fear the dark side as you do. I have brought peace, freedom, justice, and security to my new empire. Your new empire? Whilst the 2011 movie attempted to establish the theme of overcoming fear and finding one's will, it was all very blasé and careless. Here these movies will dive deep into that, that how through overcoming and controlling his fear, and by extension his other emotions, is then able to ask interesting questions about the human experience, about the conditions we put ourselves through. I think the core thesis of this saga can be one about a character navigating his emotional experience to find a genuine sense of fulfillment, and what we see over six movies is a hero face the emotional spectrum, literally and metaphorically, coming out the other side wiser and better for it. That the key to happiness to life is about emotional regulation, being in control of your fear, greed, hope, love, harnessing it all to fight the darkness and the death within ourselves. In psychology terms, they call this the shadow, the darkness that lives within us. That this theme for the entire saga can even have a literal example made of it as well. The white light defeating the black lanterns, so what we're doing is giving our character internal and philosophical stakes. As you can tell, that is a lot of depth for a superhero film. If anything, I would treat the dialogue scenes with as much care as David Lowry does with his Green Knight film. Ask the right questions to make our heroes reach the right depths of introspection. Is it wrong? To want greatness for you. I fear I'm not meant for greatness. The Green Knight is a story of honour, of a character that has to face his fears, his responsibility, what it is to be a man, themes that lend itself to a Green Lantern movie. I'm not saying a Green Lantern movie needs to be steeped in realism, just pull the same dramatic weight from the Green Knight in dialogue scenes, have characters cut at core truths about each other, make harsh jabs that reveal character moving the story forward, have characters that are powerful, feel powerful, show the magnitude of action and the awe of presence. Green Knight leans into the weirdness of its source material and I believe if a Green Lantern movie is going to have any weight it has to do the same. It has to have a cinematic edge that makes these high sci-fi ideas feel intimate yet epic. The Green Knight isn't just a great movie in terms of depth of character but also in use of colour, something I think that should be used in a Green Lantern movie. The movie employs the use of yellow to highlight Gawain's fears, carefully used to symbolise that fear in key points in the movie. 
engulfing him, casting over him, wearing it. Hal Jordan's character isn't revolutionary, it's a character we've seen many times before, but there's so much possibility for depth here, in a way reminding me of Chris Pine's Kirk from the Star Trek movies, navigating a hotshot through a journey of responsibility similar to that of Hal, facing his fears. This funnily enough brings me to the score. Whilst I think a soundtrack would give the movie a lot of character, something in the vein of what Gunn did with Guardians, ultimately I want the movie to feel timeless. If what we're creating is an almost grand, operatic six movie saga, then the music should be representative of that. Something like Michael Giacchino's work on Star Trek has to be some of the best music ever put to film. Seriously, this album is everything. If we can work this into action, the moments of tension, sacrifice, whatever it is, Please, just do what you can to have music like this in a Green Lantern movie. I want big horns and trumpets, deep drums emphasizing key moments. I need the music to carry the rivalry of Hal and Sinestro, to make it feel Shakespearean. I want to see layers to Sinestro, not a one-note version of someone disinterested with the core. I want to see a man fearful of chaos erupting on his homeworld of Korrigar. Those fears make him strive for order. It makes him authoritarian. Something I think would be fun is seeing Sinestro's homeworld of Korrigar prosper on the surface under his authoritarian rule. But as we start to go deeper into the world, we see the suffering. If anything, this would be an obvious commentary on communism, the social climate, a Soviet state with citizens fearful of its government. A sector that is sure peaceful, but at the cost of people's freedom, much like China today. I want to see Sinestro try and justify that worldview and his disgust for a galaxy in chaos, that his order mentality was birthed from a good place, just taken way too far. You think I enjoy this? Look at the universe the Guardians have created. We have the greatest power in the cosmos, and what have they made us? Garbage collectors. We pick up the trash. A thief here, a killer there. Scum, dirt, filth. There's no end to it. But there could be. To him, the Guardians are out of touch. They don't see what it's like on the front lines. I'd like to have him mentor Hal, show him the galaxy, and on the way, Sinestro is seeing a lot of qualities he likes in Hal. He's free thinking just like himself, willing to talk back to the Guardians, in a way reminding him of Avan Sir before him. I want to see Sinestro dismiss Abin's Blackest Night prophecy as crazy talk, but as events start to unfold and the lies of the Guardians start to unearth themselves, he understands that the Guardians are paralyzed by their fear, their mistakes, that the universe is peace based on a lie, on cover-ups, that if the universe is truly going to have order, we'll have to weaponize people's fear. So he creates his own core. The Guardians naturally will oppose this, enabling the Green Lantern's use to use lethal force against Sinestro's core. And so in a way, Sinestro has won. The authoritarian rule he wanted has come to pass. The Green Lanterns, whilst defeating Sinestro, physically have lost morally. The Green Lantern Corps becoming a more militaristic police force. The Guardians deciding who is an enemy of the core, and the lines blurring between right and wrong. From peacekeepers to enforcers, much like what happened to the Jedi. We're keepers of the peace, not soldiers. I think Abin Sur has to be a big part of the first trilogy. After all, he's integral to Sinestro and Atrocitus's stories, not just Hal's origin. This is why I think it's equally important that we make him feel like someone who was actually alive, that he had a story of his own, that we see that. After all, movie making 101 is show don't tell. Abin Sur was a great warrior, my mentor. Let's see that, interlace flashbacks to show a character's philosophy or how they were motivated down a path of their own self-destruction. These developments and expansions on the characters should come as the story unravels, not spoiled in a stupid opening prologue that ruins the viewing experience of discovering Oa and other planets for the first time. We should be taken along this crazy ride with the characters, with Hal, not be a bystander to it. We should take our time developing them. We're doing a saga here, we can establish a character and then return to them two movies later. That being said, the characters should be able to stand on their own in that movie. So, as I've loosely explained, the saga should begin with the origin. However, instead of returning to Earth only to get a dull movie about a guy who screams a lot... Yeah, okay, we get it, jeez. Instead, we dive deeper into the cosmic, a mentor-mentee movie with characters with similar strengths and will, just one a little more jaded and battle-hardened than the other, one that has a little more heart than the other. A hero's journey story that establishes the core theme that'll be expanded upon in later movies. In the sequel, we'll do Sinestro Call, sure how ultimately it will defeat Sinestro, but at the cost of the Guardians being forced to change their principles. So much so that Sinestro eventually gets what he wants. The movie will also introduce the Star Sapphires, female Guardians from 
from long ago that refused to deny emotion and started their own all girls club. Again, this highlights how wrong the Guardians were for not using emotion in their decisions, thinking that that was somehow a good idea with the Manhunters, which is another mistake they made. All these mistakes and contradictions and lack of emotion being too much for Gansett and Said, so they leave the Guardians going into movie 3. Movie 3 will be about the rage of the Red Lanterns and the finale to this first trilogy. It will have a big ending and all, but most importantly it will introduce the Blue Lanterns, a cure to the Red Lanterns corrupting power of rage and give us a natural progression to Gansett's character. If by now it not being obvious that the sins of the Guardians past is a large part of these stories, it being the catalyst that created Atrocitus's rage in the first place and something I'll come back to in just a moment. Movie 4 should mirror 3, instead starting with a big battle, much like the narrative inversions I was talking about earlier. I think it shouldn't be as simple as just to introduce the cause of compassion and greed, but add a level of nuance to what those words mean, especially with Hal, that up until this point he's not being greedy per se, but selfish, selfish in love and how he treats Carol. What we get is an increasingly personal movie as the story unravels, redefining the word of greed to almost mean indulgent, selfish and excessive. With movie 5, Krona and the First Lantern Volthoom will be the antagonist. This movie will be the most egregious dive into the sins of the Guardians yet. It will show the creation of the First Lantern, how Krona first harnessed the power of will through his gauntlet, how the Guardians initially stopped Krona as he went mad with power but took that invention and harnessed the power of will themselves into rings. Krona, after re-emerging, wants to release the First Lantern, his creation, a being powerful enough to wipe out the Guardians and start a new galactic order. Naturally, our heroes defeat Volthoom and Krona which sets up movie 6. The Guardian sins are a narrative through line in all of these movies. These sins and mistakes are created through their fear of the Blackest Night prophecy, a prophecy we've heard of since movie 1. All their mistakes and sins have been to cover up and avoid this day from coming to light, or darkness more accurately. Here this movie uses everything we've learned about, that the value of emotion will forge a white lantern that can repel the forces of Scar, Necron and the Black Lanterns. Like I mentioned before, I think a TV show should run concurrent with the movies. A lazy direction for the show would be to set up conflicts in the movies, tease reveals we'll see in the film. A much better direction would be to explore new parts of the cosmos that we just won't get to see in the movies. What does the underbelly of Korrigar look like? The poverty of rebel factions or the planet fighting against Sinestro's rule? Where do the scum and villainy of the cosmos hang out? Rimbor? What are the alien clubs and seedy districts like? Is there a frontier of unexplored space that needs discovering? How many earthling lanterns are on Earth? Who has the closest relationship to Kilowog? All these sorts of questions could fuel a season of a show, with each movie giving us more to unpack in a follow-up season. Six episodes of great character work, origins for these heroes that make defined, likeable characters characters, making us eagerly await their arrival on the big screen. Green Lantern can not only be DC's Star Wars, it is DC's Star Wars. No other superhero can match this potential and scale. Maybe Nova if they really leaned on the sci-fi angle? All I'm saying is it's a massive undertaking doing Green Lantern right. In the wrong hands it'd be borderline impossible. James Wan had the right idea with his Aquaman movie, to lean into the scale and exploration of what this property has to offer. The movie could be the world's next big franchise. Green Lantern can be so much more than what we got and I eagerly await the day that Warner Brothers finally decide to produce a good Green Lantern movie.